if it wasn't for the fact that we had a lot of new members, I'd say Larry Mitchell doesn't need a need a uh, introduction. But uh, uh, but let's 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 do it anyway because I think it's important to uh, uh, just understand uh, what Larry means to the uh, uh, astronomy community. Uh, Larry's been a longtime member of uh, HAS, and uh, as uh, and as long as I've been a member of HAS, I've I've known. Uh, Larry is uh, as a big help to uh, uh, folks who are uh, trying to uh, learn how to become better visual observers. And um, one of the things that Larry has done to, uh, to further the art of visual observing is at the Texas Star Party. Uh, he's uh, been uh, the longtime, uh, over 20 year uh, author of uh, the advanced observing list at the Texas Star Party. Now, a lot of folks call it uh, just Larry's list. And depending on the year, I've heard some of them call it something quite different than that because it was pretty hard, but yes, uh, no, no matter, no matter what uh, the list of objects has been, Larry's always been there to uh, uh, explain and, uh, and instruct and help us understand what it is that, uh, the, that we're observing and how to observe it. And with that, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, to Larry, who's going to talk about the best of the rest of the 20 years of the uh, advanced observing list. All right. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, I've got a lot to cover tonight. So I'm, uh, I'm essentially trying to cover the entire universe uh, in an uh, hour, hour and 15 minutes. So um, bear with me. I'll do the best that I can. The um, advanced observing list is part of uh, it is one of two observing lists that we have uh, at the Texas Star Party. The other one is the regular program, which is headed up by John Wagner in, in Dallas. And John's been doing it actually longer than I have. And he, he does a very, very good job with that. The advanced list I started in you know, the year 2000 with mainly two goals in mind. Number one, uh, to get people to be better technicians with their telescope. Um, to go out and try to find objects that they might not think they could otherwise see that have weird sounding names. Most people are comfortable with NGC objects or Messier objects, but when you tell them uh, Arachelian something or Gulbudagian something, uh, they, they, uh, they, they panic. Uh, and they, they tend to think they cannot see those objects when if they try, they can. Uh, so we try to get people to look at more exotic, unusual objects. Uh, number one, and then number two is to educate. Uh, I want people to understand what they're looking at, why it's there, what it's doing. Um, because if you look in a telescope field and you see some faint fuzzy object and that's all, you, that, that's all you see, that's all you know about that object. But if you know that it's a galaxy 150 million light years away and it has a supermassive black hole in the center and it's blowing out uh, relativistic jets uh, 100,000 light years uh, in length, that gives it meaning. That makes it an interesting object to look at, and it certainly makes it more interesting than some little fuzzy thing that you know nothing about in a telescope uh, field. So those are the two main uh, goals, to uh, look at um, some more exotic objects in the universe and also to learn about what you're looking at uh, and learn about the universe. Um, it's... Um, um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to cover a lot of territory tonight. Uh, I've got my email uh, at the end on the last slide. I, this is a review, so I'm barely going to scrape the surface of each of the objects that I'm going to be talking about. So um, anyway, with that, we'll get started. Um, this is the upper field at the Texas Star Party. It's one of three observing fields. And the night sky uh, in West Texas, which is held in Fort Davis uh, every year, and the night sky is phenomenal. It's, one of, it's among the darkest skies in the entire United States, and it's also one of the driest skies. We have, it's not unusual to have humidity of 15%. So you're not looking through an ocean of water when you're looking at something in the night sky, and we're at an elevation of about 5,000 feet. So that certainly, that certainly helps as well. Um, a lot of star parties have wonderful skies, dark skies and things of that nature, but a lot of, a lot of star parties don't have what TSP has. 
um, which is accommodations. We've got we've got rooms, we've got bunk houses, um, family cabins. Uh, we have enough um, places for six or seven hundred people to stay. Um, this photograph was taken from the front porch of my cabin. Uh, so that is very nice. And we also have food at the Texas Star Party. So you don't have to go into town, although there is food in town. But um, you, you, can, you can eat right there on the ranch. It's the Prude Ranch. And it's in Fort Davis, Texas. And uh, it, it just, it, it makes life easy. You can stay up all night and sleep all day. And, and it's, just, it's just very, very nice. Plus, uh, we get to uh, we, we get to make a lot of lifelong friendships. Uh, people from all over the world come to the Texas Star Party. My first, my first uh, time there was in 1987, and I looked up at the sky, and I couldn't believe it. I, I thought I knew the sky, but I couldn't even find a constellation Virgo because there were so many stars in the sky. Um, so that's why all of us come to West Texas for those pristine skies, and it, it, really, is, it really is fantastic. Um, so this year's observing rules for the advanced observing list is by far the easiest list I've ever, I've ever put out. Um, I'm trying to give people, uh, a, a reward for some of the retinal torture that I've put them uh, through in the past. And I've made this list very easy. Someone with a 18, 20 inch telescope could probably see every object on this list. There's a, there's a few challenge objects. But by and large, it's easy. Um, all you have to do is observe 20 out of the 40, uh, 40 observations. You need to do it in the next week from June 5th to June 13th. And those of you out there, I hope you have better weather than we're having here in Houston because uh, it rained today and it, it's, we have a good chance of rain for the next week. So um, we, we, may, we may be on hard times here. But I won't cover all of this because uh, it, it's in the website, the TSP website um, with uh, internet access and you just, you just dial up the Texas Star Party activities, the observing programs uh, and go to the uh, advanced observing programs and you can download this list as well as a handout which covers uh, each, of these, uh, each of these objects. These are the pins that I've handed out in the past starting with the year 2000. Uh, this one here is the pen that that uh, we'll be handing out this year. I've got uh, I've got 95 of them that I'm going to hand out to the, the, the first 95 people, um, and um, we also have I also have plenty of pens of past years that we're handing out as well. Now, I I do most of this myself, but um, I don't do all of it. I have some very very good help. Uh, these are these are all amateurs by uh, uh, by definition, but they're professionals in, in my book. Um, Jim and, Aunt, and Anna Chandler live in Fort Davis, and they have uh, supplied me with many many good ideas over the years and observations. Paul Downing has a beautiful observatory in Spain, southern Spain, and he takes professional photographs and sends them to me. Jimmy Lowry has a 48-inch telescope named Barbarella. Uh, this in Fort Davis, and it's a wonderful instrument to look through. Jose Sancho uh, has observed with me for many, many years, uh, and he keeps me honest with some of the observations that I think you can see in a 36-inch telescope, but you may not be able to see in his 18-inch telescope. And he has his world-famous Sancho Succo scale, which he keeps throwing up at me. Um, but uh, that's the kind of information that I need, uh, because I'm trying to Taylor make this to 15, 16 inch telescopes. Amelia and Steve Goldberg, uh, their, their input is just invaluable. Um, they are my observing buddies at our site in Columbus. Um, they are constantly giving me ideas of things to do, things to look at. Um, they critique my writing um, and which they always find something wrong with it, usually by the second or third sentence. Um, so they're, uh, and I'm over at their house right now. So I, I, I can't thank those guys enough, really. Uh, and then Keith, Keith uh, Rivich, uh, we know him as K2, is probably one of the finest observers in the entire world. Um, Keith is an amazing, amazing observer. And he and I have spent many, many hours uh, sharing eyepieces together. So uh, I 
a huge thank you to these people uh, because without their help, uh, the advanced observing program would not be what it is, uh, probably wouldn't even exist. So thank you guys. All right, I talk about star hopping. I promote star hopping. Um, a lot of people have their computers and their go-to systems and all that, and that's fine. If, 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 and, and that's acceptable for the program if that's what you're gonna do. But if you learn how to find things without a computer in the sky, you can find it with anybody's telescope on any night. And if you do it three or four times and you, and, and you wanna go back to it, you, you can memorize it then you don't need a computer. You can find it on your own. I can find most of these objects, like the, the, the two that I'm gonna show you here in about five seconds. Um, when you can do that without a computer, it get, just gets to be really fun. The, thing, the first thing you do is you find a naked eye star um, and, and hop off from that. Um, some, some people will go, will tail rad and go to the general area and try to wander around until they find an asterism or something they recognize. But if you start off, with a bright naked eye star, you can't go wrong. And the first thing you do from that is you determine if you're gonna go north, south, east, or west from that star. If you're going to go directly to the, uh, to the uh, target or if you're going to an asterism. And on star charts, if you go to the left of your bright star, if you go to the left, you're going east. If you go to the right, you're going west. If you go up, you're going north and, and down is south. So determine which direction to move your telescope and go to your first uh, target, whether that's an asterism or whether it's, it's the object you're looking for. So to find the Eskimo Nebula, first thing you wanna do is find this star, Wasat uh, in Gemini. And this is real easy because there's a bright star behind it. And if you use that as a pointer, well, it points directly to this trio of stars. Actually, it's a crescent, but these three stars are very bright and very obvious in any finder scope. So you've gone east from there. And from here, if you go to the southeast and you'll see a faint fuzzy looking type star in your finder scope, well, if you if you have your finder scope centered with your main scope, which you should do, uh, have illuminated crosshairs on your finder scope. Um, if you look at that faint fuzzy star, um, there's your reward, the Eskimo Planetary Nebula. Um, and that is very, very easy to do and it's easy to memorize. Um, another object, M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. First, find the tail star of the Big Dipper. Uh, which is Alcade, is, uh, any, anybody can find that star. From there, you want to go due west. You go due west, you will find this asterism of four stars. It's kind of a crooked rectangle of, of sorts. Um, it's very obvious in any finder scope, uh, easily seen. If you use the brighter of the stars in the uh, the rectangle uh, as your pointers, well, that points to this triangle of stars here, which again is an obvious asterism of stars. Now from here, you have to kind of be careful because you've got a bright star here and you got a bright star here. What I do is I bisect these stars here. So I go to the right star, this star. Um, when you go to this star in your finder scope, just about any finder scope, if you look a little bit to the southwest of that, you'll see the whirlpool. And if you've done that properly and it's easy to do, there's your reward, uh, M51, the, the whirlpool galaxy. So this is star hopping. And people get all concerned about holding charts upside down and doing all this other kind of stuff. Just pay attention to which direction you need to go north, south, east, or west. If you go in the proper direction, you've got to go to the asterism. And then if you go, if you, if you use that, you've got to go to your next one. Um, and it makes it easy. And believe me, this is so much more fun than using a computer. With a computer, all you know is what you're looking at is somewhere up there, but you have no idea where. Um, if you star hop, 
you know exactly what constellation, where you are, how you found it, and if you and again, if you do it two or three times, you can do it again. Um, so that's a that's that's a little bit of my star hopping 101, I suppose. But um, believe me, it's much, much more fun when you do it this way. And you know, if it's a faint object and you've star hopped over to that object and it is very faint, it's just above the, it's just above the background, well, you know exactly where in the field to look. Uh, and sometimes you need that in order to see some of these faint objects. So with that, um, I'm going to start off on each year, starting with 2000. And every year I give a talk on the, the covers that year's observing program. So what I've done in the left-hand corner of each year is the cover slide for that particular uh, lecture that I gave. So in 2000, the subject was rings, rings over the Texas Star Party. And that is kind of a rough uh, way to start, get people started because when you take the center out of a galaxy or you take the center out of any of these objects, you're taking the brightest part of that object away. Uh, you're leaving the faintest outer regions for people to find. And, and, and so I started off with a, a rather difficult uh, program, but, but this was of interest to me and uh, it was of interest to a lot of other people as well. Um, but these objects uh, uh, are nebula, planetary nebula, galaxies, polar ring galaxies, anything that doesn't have a center. That year, we had Dr. Alan Dressler as a keynote speaker. Dr. Dressler is uh, famous uh, among uh, uh, galaxy people. He was one of the big proponents to study what's called the Great Attractor. Uh, he had a group of people working with him and they called themselves the Seven Samurai. Um, Dr. Dressler discovered that our part of the universe is moving towards the, uh, the uh, Virgo uh, cluster, Virgo galaxy cluster, and the Virgo galaxy cluster is moving towards the Laniaca a super cluster, and that is moving to the Great Attractor, and that is moving to what's called the Shapley super galaxy cluster. So our whole part of the universe is moving in that direction. And that's what uh, Dr. Dressler was working on, and that's what he talked to us at uh, TSP about. Since then, he's immersed himself in, in more works with galaxies, how galaxies, uh, evolution of galaxies, how they evolve uh, and what they're doing. And he gave a wonderful talk. <clears throat> All right, one of the objects, the first object that I have on the list is uh, NGC 6337, which we call the Cheerio because it looks like a, a Cheerio uh, a cereal uh, piece. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically a donut, a circle. And the reason for this uh, is, there, there are many reasons actually, but this is a planetary nebula. This is a star that is an act of dying. Um, a few things I want to try to explain. Uh, some, of, some of you folks, this may be a, a little elementary, but the speed of light. Light travels at 186,300 miles a second or 300,000 kilometers a second in a vacuum. Space is not a vacuum. It's a much better vacuum than we can create on Earth, but still it's not a vacuum, but we treat it as if it were. A light year is how far, um, how far light travels in one year. Uh, and it works out to just under six trillion miles. Most people round it off to uh, six trillion miles. That is both a distance and a time measurement. Uh, when we say something is 50 million light years away, it's taken light 50 million years to get here. So that's a time measurement. The distance is you could take that 50 million and multiply it by 6 trillion and you'd come up with some unbelievable number, uh, but that's a distance number. Uh, so a light year is both time and, uh, time and distance. And that has uh, something to do with space time, which I'll talk about. Temperatures that I have listed here are on, all on the Kelvin scale, which is a scientific scale based on absolute zero. Um, most people, if you're familiar with the Celsius scale, uh, Kelvin and Celsius are very similar. Uh, Celsius is, is 273.15 degrees below the Kelvin scale. So essentially for what we're talking about, they are the same. But 
the reason, one big reason for the Kelvin scale is this three digits, which is always more accurate than two digits. Um, so um, that's a, uh, that, that's a that's a big reason for uh, using Kelvin and everything you see, all your temperatures that you see in here are gonna be 105,000 Kelvin. Um, all right, back to the Cheerio. This is a planetary nebula, which is a star that is dying. At some point, our sun will go through a similar stage in about 5 billion years. And essentially what happens when you have a structure like this, this tells us a lot of things. It tells us that the central star is a binary star. It has a companion. And as this star is dying, um, it puffs, it, 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 it swells up and the, it goes through a red giant phase. And if it is large enough, it infuses helium at hundred million degrees and, and goes through a second swelling up called the asymptotic giant branch stage or the AGB. And, but at some point, the star gets so big that the outer portions of the star are no longer gravitationally bound to the center and they start drifting away in what we call a slow wind. As it drifts away, the center part of the star, uh, the center part of the nebula and the companion to the nebula spin that star up and it starts throwing mass out along the equatorial region and it forms a belt. And that belt is what we're seeing here and we call that a torus. That belt acts as a constricting belt so that later eruptions go through the polar regions. And those are the lobes and they're much fainter than normally much fainter than the torus around the center. So if you see it from the side, we see an hourglass figure like this or like this. But if you imagine, if you turn it and we're looking down, if we're looking through the polar regions of the star, what we call pole on view, then we're going to see the torus is a donut. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Um, we're seeing these lobes pointed towards us and away from us. And all we're seeing is the torus, this belt. And most of the planetary nebula that we look at, this is what we see, because this is typically the brightest part. Not, not always. In some cases, we do see, it, we do see the, the, uh, the lobes. But in most cases, this is what we're seeing. In this particular case, the distance is 5,200 light years. And all planetary nebula distances are very, very vague because we have to base it on the star. Well, this is not a regular star. This is a star that's either uh, gaining in temperature because it's a white dwarf or it's decreasing in temperature. Uh, so it's not a real star as such. And it's also shining through these lobes. And, and, and so its light fluctuates. So it's not, a, it's not acting like a real star. And it's very difficult to get a distance on something of that nature. So some of these planetary nebula distances are off by 100% or more. Um, but in this particular case, the nebula temperature is 45,000 degrees. Uh, its age is between 12 and 24,000 years. The central star has a magnitude of 14.9, but you cannot go by that. Um, the central star in the ring nebula M57 is about 16 magnitude, but sometimes I can't even hardly see it in my 36 inch telescope. So these central stars are variable because of all the things that are going on about, about and around them. So that's a little bit about planetary nebula and how they form. And hopefully everybody is with me on that. This is NGC 6888, the Crescent Nebula. And those of you that are going to do the observing program, by all means, should look at this. This is one of the showpieces of the heavens. We refer to it as eye candy. Um, and with a nebula filter, this is a beautiful, beautiful object. I might point out the distance to the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, is 4.24 light years. Four light years only to the nearest star. The temperature of our sun is about 6,000 degrees Kelvin, just a little below 6,000 degrees. So this particular object here is what we call a wolf Rye Nebula. They're also known as Ring Nebula. We're seeing this object from the side. If we could tilt it from the pole on view, it would be a ring. We, we, it would look very similar to this. 
<clears throat> but we're seeing this from the side. And Wolf Rye stars are very, very massive, very large stars, uh, 25 to 50 uh, times uh, our solar mass. They're huge. And they, being very large, they have a very short lifetime. Our sun has a life expectancy, a lifetime of about 10 billion years. A Wolf Rye star may only last two or three million years because it is so massive. It burns through all of its resources in a very short amount of time. This object, the, uh, the, the, the Crescent Nebula, has had three major mass loss uh, episodes, the main sequence, the red giant branch, and the wolf Rye sequence. Uh, when it goes through the wolf Rye sequence, that is very rapid. It loses a tremendous amount of mass in a very short amount of time. Uh, usually on an average of something like one solar mass every 100,000 years. Um, so that's a tremendous amount of material that this star is throwing out. Um, this star is only, uh, the Wolf Rye uh, event star is only 1.9 million years old. Um, it originally held 25 to 40 solar masses. It's thrown off enough material now, it's only down to about 15 solar masses. Um, 250,000 to 400,000 years ago, it was, a, it was a red giant. So it's it is actively throwing out material. And you can see this uh, with a nebula filter in almost any amateur telescope. It's beautiful. It is absolutely gorgeous. And it's easy to find. It's located 2.7 degrees southwest of Gamma Sigma, Cygni. And Gamma Cygni is the cross star uh, of Cygnus, or some people call it the Northern Cross. It's the one right in the middle. It's easily found. And in a telescope, uh, finder field, if you move your telescope to the southwest just a little bit, you want to look for a flattened diamond-shaped asterism, which looks like that. <clears throat> and, and the southern star of that asterism is the Wolf Rye star. That is the star that is throwing this cloud out. It's illuminating this cloud. And as the slower winds slap into the faster uh, or the faster wind slap into the slower moving winds that is also ionizing it um, so this is easily found uh, just just find the, uh, the the flat diamond and go to the southern star you can't miss it all right 2001 um, advanced observing uh, we had explosions uh, over TSP as a topic and we had some more uh, very, very uh, excellent speakers. Uh, Timothy Ferris, uh, who is a noted author, has written several books on astronomy. Um, if you uh, ever get in the car with Timothy, be prepared for a ride because he likes to go about 100 miles an hour. You know? <laughs> um, but uh, he gave a very, very good talk uh, at our 2001 uh, TSP. Paul Hickson, uh, this was his second visit to TSP. Paul is noted for his Hickson 100 uh, compact galaxy clusters. Uh, he's also noted for inventing a spinning Mercury telescope, which he had uh, up in uh, British Columbia, BC, where, which is where he still is. And uh, we very much enjoyed uh, Paul being there and would like to get him back again. On the right-hand side is Steve O'Meara. Uh, Steve, there for a while, was a fixture at TSB. Steve's a good friend of mine. Uh, the picture down below is a talk that he gave of, of um, a trip that he and me and his wife uh, went with the National Geographic crew to a volcano in the middle of the Mediterranean Ocean called Stromboli. And we were there for two weeks and they made a TV movie about this. And Steve gave a talk on our escapades at the volcano. And this is the outfit that we had to wear when we were on top of the mountain because it was throwing lava bombs at us right and left. Uh, and it was a very, very uh, interesting uh, two weeks. And of course, this is how Steve looks with, uh, without, without the gear. Um, but uh, Steve has been to numerous uh, TSPs and those of you that know Steve, he's got incredible, incredible eyesight. Uh, uh, he, he calls himself a visual athlete. He, he works at it. Um, I've spent many, many hour observing with Steve and he's as good as you think he is. Um, um, but uh, uh, he's also giving a talk uh, next week um, on uh, Botswana, 
uh, observing in Botswana land, which is where he's living now. <clears throat> All right, um, we'll spend some time on this. Um, but um, first off, I want to talk a little bit about um, the concept of space time. The um, space time is something a lot of people don't, um, a lot of uh, amateurs aren't really familiar with, but space is three dimensional as we know. Um, but it's, but time is also enter into it. <clears throat> But time also move, uh, is, it enter, enters into it uh, because of what I mentioned a minute ago. It takes, light travels at a finite speed, 186,000 miles a second. So it takes light time to get here. So when we're describing the universe, we have to consider the time factor as much as we, as, as much as the depth and, and, and uh, the, uh, the three-dimensional space factor that, that people typically talk about. One thing that I'm going to emphasize here is co-moving distances or co-moving radial distance. This is the distance that is actually, uh, that an object actually is at. Most people throw distances around like 50 million light years away, 100 million light years away. All that really is, is light travel time. We refer to that as look back time. If I say a galaxy is 100 million light years away, it's taken light 100, light, 100 million years to get here, traveling at 186,300 miles a second. But that's not where the galaxy is when those photons reach your eyeballs. Because during that 100 million years, the, the universe has expanded. So it's much further away than 100 million, than 100 million years. Uh, so we call that co-moving distances. You have light coming at you, but it's moving away from us at the same time. Um, the universe was formed 13.8 billion years ago. And originally that was a, an inflationary period where the universe expanded faster than the speed of light, but then it settled down. And in our part of the universe, uh, it's expanding at something called Hubble's constant. And there, Hubble's constant is numbers all over the place, but it seems to be settling out around 70, um, 70 um, kilometers per second um, per megaparsec. And a megaparsec being 3.26 um, million light years. So that's how space in our part of the world is expanding. However, and next Friday, Dr. Gephardt is going to talk about dark energy, uh, which is a talk I'm really looking forward to, because somewhere around 4.5 to 5 billion light years out, the universe suddenly starts speeding up uh, in its expansion. There's some negative gravitational effect called dark energy that we don't understand what is causing that, but nevertheless, the universe is speeding up uh, as, as we go further out from the universe. In general, for uh, objects from us, a billion light years uh, out, a billion and a half light years out, um, the, the, um, the, the, the cosmological redshift, which is what we call uh, the expansion of the universe, the cosmological redshift and the look back time are pretty much the same. And this only applies to quasars and very distant objects. But once we get beyond uh, a couple of billion light years, it does make a difference. So these two objects here, uh, well, for instance, I, 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 I made a, a sample. Um, if we have a redshift of six, a Z factor of six, it took 12.8 billion years for that light to get here. Took, that's how long it took that light to, to, to reach uh, our telescopes. But during this 12.8 billion years, this object moved away. So its real distance is 27.5 billion light years away, not 12 billion light years. Um, the universe as we know it uh, is about 95 billion light years in diameter. Uh, which means we can see out about 43 billion light years in any one direction. Um, at some point, the, the universe uh, expansion exceeds the speed of light. And beyond that, we won't be able to see anything because 
those objects will never be able to get here because it's expanding faster than the object is moving this way. So hopefully that's not confusing too much for everybody. Um, but um, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's, it's a lot to throw at people. Um, a um, 6 billion uh, light year object, for instance, is 7.6 billion light years in real distance. Uh, if we had an object, if we can see an object 13.8 billion light years away, it, its distance would really be 46 billion light years. There is a database on the, on the internet. It's a Ned Wright, uh, Ned Wright database, for those of you that would like to look at this further. Um, and um, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's very interesting. It's got a calculator there where you can calculate all this out yourselves. But the, um, I'm gonna start with 3C273 and it's JET uh, first. Uh, this was the first optical quasar along with 3C48 that was discovered. Uh, quasars were actually discovered back in the 50s. They found a bunch of them, but they were radio loud objects and they could not find a visual counterpart, which is why they called them quasi-stellar objects, QSOs. Um, it wasn't until 1963 that Alan Sandage finally found an optical counterpart to one of these one of these radio objects, one of these uh, quasi-stellar objects. And this was it, 3C273. This is the brightest quasar. It has a magnitude of 14.8, which is really bright, but it has an actual distance of 2.6 billion light years. Um, that's an awfully bright object to be that far away. It's located in an elliptical galaxy and that galaxy has one billion solar mass black hole in the center. The black hole in the center of our Milky Way is about 4.1 million, uh, million light years. So a billion, light, a billion light year mass black hole is a monster. And that's what you see in elliptical galaxies. And that is what is powering this jet. Uh, and it's, it is shooting material out, which for us seems to be super luminal. It seems like it's moving faster than the speed of light, but that's only because it's moving at an angle to us and we see it moving at a shorter distance. It's, a, it's, it's an illusion. Um, the other object on here is the double quasar. And this is probably the most difficult object I've got on this, uh, this year's list. It's the first gravitational lens discovered. Uh, it was discovered in 1979. And it proved that galaxy bends light. You've got a quasar that's way in the background. The quasar is actually 12.8 billion light years away, but it's almost exactly behind a very massive elliptical galaxy that's 4.26 billion light years away. And that foreground elliptical galaxy is acting as a magnifying glass. And it's magnifying that quasar in the background, but it's also splitting the images up into two separate images, which are separated by about six arc seconds. And you can see them here. You can also, with the Hubble Space Telescope, see the galaxy. This is the uh, illuminating galaxy that's in the foreground that's, that, that's, causing this, that's causing this mirage. And this backed up Einstein's theory that yes, uh, gravity does bend light. Um, his, his theory of general rel relativity, uh, part of it was proved by this. Uh, there's also a time delay between the two objects and we use this to determine how fast our part of the, of the universe is expanding. Uh, and in these two, uh, one has 64 and one has 72. And, and I said a minute ago, uh, I've rounded all of my distances off to 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Uh, so all of these distances that you, that you see that I've, I've, I'm talking about here are based on 70 and, and not uh, some other factor. All right, uh, active galactic nu nuclei, uh, NGC 4151. Uh, this is the standard uh, of the Seifert-1 type galaxies. Seifert-1 galaxies are the most active galaxies. Uh, they act like quasars. Uh, they have, they're shooting a jet out at relativistic speeds, which is almost the speed of light. Um, I mentioned a minute ago, our Milky Way galaxy has a black hole, Sagittarius A star, of 4.1 million uh, solar masses. 
Uh, that black hole is roughly the diameter of our solar system, about the distance from sun out, sun out to uh, Uranus. The black hole in the middle of this one is 46 million solar masses. And it's throwing jets of material out at a high speed. And there's a second black hole of 10 million solar masses, uh, which they think orbits uh, in about 15.8 years. Anytime you look at one of these Seifert galaxies, you see a bright stutter like nucleus. And this, is, this one is very bright. Uh, through a telescope, you see a faint ha uh, outer halo. You see some of the spiral arms, which are very, very faint, but the center is very bright. ARC-220 is a true monster. This is one of the most explosive forces in the universe that we know of. Uh, its distance is 250 million light years. This is the most luminous, uh, ultra luminous infrared galaxy that we know of. Um, it, it has a luminosity of a trillion times the sun. Um, it is less than a billion years old and, it's, and it is composed of stars that are forming at a rapid pace, uh, 340 solar masses per year, which is unheard of. And it's calculated, which seems to me an unbelievable number, and I double checked this, but, but uh, it seems to be true. It contains more energy in this galaxy than 100 million Milky Ways would contain. That, that's an unbelievable number, but that seems to be, uh, that seems to be the thinking. It has two, uh, two nuclei, two rotating black holes. They counter rotate. They're currently about one arc second apart. And something they're finding out about uh, merging black holes, if there is a counter-rotating type of thing, they tend to rebound. Um, this one hasn't done anything like that yet, but they do have some examples for some galaxies with uh, close uh, proximity black holes that are actually rebounding. So they don't, they don't just merge nicely like you know, what a lot of people think. All right, 2002, interactions. When galaxies collide, a whole bunch of things happen. So they form rings. Uh, here's a galaxy going through another galaxy. Um, they usually form stars. Uh, there's compression effects. Uh, stars are being formed. Stars are blowing up. There's all kinds of dynamics which happens when, uh, when galaxies merge. These are three objects that I have on the list for the observing list for this year. The box or Hickson 61, uh, named for Paul Hickson that you met earlier, um, is a uh, beautiful visual object. Uh, there's, there's four objects here. Uh, they average 180 million light years distance, but it's actually a triplet. 40, NGC 4173 is only about 50 million light years away, whereas these other three objects are about 50. Uh, or 180 million light years away. They're much, much more distant. And each one of these are interacting with each other. This one is truncated. This is a polar ring galaxy. This has H2 regions. Uh, an H2 region, for those of you who don't know, is a star forming region where uh, very massive stars are ionizing the cloud, the gas cloud around it and causing that cloud to glow. And that, that, that glow or that ionizing is hydrogen being stripped of its electron. Uh, and that's causing that, that cloud to glow similar to a neon uh, light bulb uh, here on earth. And, and that glow is what we see and we call those an H2 region. Um, it, this, is, uh, this is dark matter dominated uh, group as pretty much all of these are. Uh, its mass to light ratio is 14.5. So th there's a lot of dark matter uh, involved in this. There's more, much more mass than light, um, and we don't know what dark matter is, but it affects, uh, it, it has something to do with gravity. Uh, it, it seems to um, uh, work with gravity, but we really don't know what, uh, what dark matter is. Dark matter comprises about 27% of the universe. Dark energy that I mentioned earlier, which is speeding the universe up, and comprises 68% of the universe which means astronomy is in an embarrassing situation that 95% of the universe we can't really account for, um, which is interesting. Um, but um, anyway, that's the way it is. Uh, Seifert Sextet, I'll jump over to this one. Uh, this is also uh, uh, one of uh, Paul Hickson's uh, finest, it's Hickson 79. 
And here again, uh, not everything is accorded. Only these four galaxies here are at the same distance and are interacting. This is debris. This is material that's thrown out of this galaxy. So this not uh, Higgson 6027E is not really a galaxy. Of interest is NGC 6027D uh, because its stated distance is 922 million light years. The rest of these galaxies are 202 million light years. So this is several orders of magnitude more distance. But if you look at it carefully, you see really more detail in this more distant object than you do any of these other objects. So that's interesting. Um, and I'll, uh, I've got some more examples of uh, similar, similar things. NGC 4298 and 40, uh, 4302 are in Coma uh, Berenices uh, at a distance of 52 million years. So they're part of the Virgo galaxy cluster. They're separated by only 5,000 light years. And when you look at them visually, there's no apparent uh, distortion. You would think, well, there's, no, uh, there's, there's nothing going on between them. But when we look at them in different light, other than visual light, uh, the hydrogen one uh, emission, uh, they're, 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 they're sharing material between them. The northern part of 4302 has a tidal tail the shooting out the top. So there's fireworks going on here, but it's not, it's not seen in visual light. And uh, all three of these objects or something that those of you that are going to get out under the sky and look, you should look at all three of these because they're just beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. This is kind of small. You need to put high magnification on this because it is so small that it would fit inside our Milky Way galaxy. The total diameter of Seyfert Sextet is only 100,000 or 100,000 uh, 100, light years. Uh, so it's, it's, it's essentially the size of our Milky Way that you can fit all of those galaxies in. Uh, so when we say Paul Higson's, uh, his catalog is compact galaxy groups, there's a compact galaxy group for you. All right, the Siamese twins, um, these are uh, in the act, both of these galaxy uh, pairs are in the act of just beginning their merging operation. Uh, ARC 220 that I showed you a minute ago as well into their merging. These are just beginning. And most of the star forming activity is along the line here. Uh, they're only separated by 20,000 light years. Uh, we're separated by two and a half million light years from the, from the uh, Andromeda uh, M31 galaxy. So these are very close to each other, um, but uh, there's very little distortion. The same thing with these two galaxies, except these two galaxies, uh, NGC 5426 and 7, are thought to have formed together at the same time. But we do see some semblance of interaction. If you can see these tidal streamers between the two galaxies, that's one. The other thing is this spiral arm here is flattened out and straight. Uh, and this, this gigantic H2 region on the end appears to be pulled out of the line. So the fact that this line, this doesn't curve around like the rest of the objects and the fact of the streamer between the two of us tells that there is some interaction that is going on, um, but there's some thinking that these two galaxies may never form, uh, may, may never actually merge into an elliptical galaxy. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, they're very, uh, these, these are, are Fairly faint, but yet noticeable in a telescope. These are noticeable in just about any telescope. Um, very, very easily seen, the Siamese twins. All right, planetary nebula. Um, I'm going to start speeding things up because I'm already running behind. Um, but um, planetary nebula stars that are stars up to eight solar masses that are going through a dying process where they're throwing off their outer portions of the star. And I kind of touched on that a minute ago. The stars spend most of their time on the main sequence where the internal fusion fires that are, uh, are pushing outward are matched by the tendency to gravitation and collapse. So the star is in a state of equilibrium and it spends 90% of its time in this equilibrium state. But eventually in the center, it gets hotter and it expands the star out so that it becomes a red giant the outer halo floats away and it becomes a planetary nebula, which uh, goes through the planetary stage, ends up a uh, white dwarf, 
uh, and actually will end up as a black dwarf. But it's theorized that the universe is not old enough for a black dwarf to yet exist. It takes about 30 billion years for a black dwarf to exist, and we're only 12 uh, or 13.8 um, billion years into it. This year, 2003, we had William Harris, who is a recognized expert on globular clusters. Uh, almost every paper that was written, uh, he had something to do with, so we were lucky to have him. Sun Kwok uh, is the reigning authority on planetary nebula. He was there that year. Um, he has written seven books uh, pertaining to planetary nebula. I used his books as my uh, source for my lecture that I gave on planetary nebula. And Sun Kwok was sitting right in front of me in the second row. Uh, and he was actually taking notes. And, um, and he said he enjoyed the talk, but even more so, he came down and enjoyed and, and observed with us that night. And he thoroughly enjoyed himself because he never gets to look at these things. Uh, he, he looks at them through uh, instruments, through CCDs and cameras, but he never actually gets to see them. So he enjoyed observing uh, with myself and uh, Barbara Wilson, who, uh, who was uh, showing him the sky. Uh, and then, of course, David Levy, uh, who is another stalwart. Uh, David has been to TSP many, many a time. He is the uh, reigning authority on comets. Uh, David has discovered 22 comets, and I think he's written 33 or 34 books, something like this. So uh, he, David has done a lot, a lot of work uh, in the realm of amateur astronomy. This is a blow up of an alien that uh, somebody uh, hung from the ceiling and it had Larry Mitchell across the front of it. Uh, somebody undoubtedly enjoying my uh, planetary uh, nebula list. But uh, these were the speakers that we had that year uh, and they were very, very uh, excellent, each one of them. All right, planetary nebula come in all shapes and, and sizes. Um, this is orientation, which I talked about a minute ago, so I won't go into, but if we see it from the side, we see uh, the, um, uh, we see this configuration. If we see it at an angle, we see a truncated type uh, object. If we see it pole on, we see a ring. Uh, these things, these are just a bunch of different planetaries that come in all shapes, sizes, orientations, and ages, and they're very, very nice to look at. Um, um, and I, 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 I love them myself. Um, spherical planetary um, are usually from. Uh, single stars, not a binary star, but a single star, usually that are rotating slowly, that have a low metallicity, and they're extremely, um, uh, some of them can be extremely hot. Uh, you need a nebula filter because a lot of times they're real faint. This is Minkowski's butterfly, and in this case, you can see the lobes. You can see the ejection. Uh, the torus is in here. You can actually see the central star uh, shining through the torus, and you can see the lobes as well. Um, so this is just a, a couple of uh, images of, of, of uh, uh, different types of planetaries that we look at. This year we had three of them. I had the Box Nebula, uh, PC22, and IC4593. In each of these cases, we're looking at the Taurus. We're looking at this central region here. Um, the, uh, the Box Nebula, um, we're at, here's a diagram of it. We're, that is the torus. Uh, you can faintly see the uh, lobes out the end. Uh, I've, I have never uh, seen them myself visually, uh, but you can capture them in photographs. And um, this has uh, multiple, uh, what we call quadrupolar lobes. In other words, not one lobe, but you got two lobes on each end. And that's because the star is wobbling. As it rotates, the star is wobbling and it throws lobes out in different directions. PC-22 is called a starfish planetary because if you look at it, it's a mess. Uh, it's a very young planetary nebula and that star is really spinning and it's throwing material out through the polar regions in all shapes, forms, and fashions. Uh, what we see is the Taurus. We don't see this, but visually we can see, we can see this part here. And, um, and it's... Uh, it's one of those planetary nebula that not many people are familiar with, uh, Pembroke Costero 22, but yet it's easily seen. It, uh, it, it's very bright. And that's the idea of what I'm trying to get people to do is look at 
unusual objects that they can see in moderate size telescopes. And this is a good example right here. Um, the, uh, there's a few other starfish planetaries, the NHIS uh, 2-47, Minkowski 137. Uh, they all look very similar to this. They're a mess. IC4593, you've got shells within shells within shells. Uh, numerous shells in here that are blowing out material. Um, you've got the uh, initial slow wind uh, from the uh, from the red giant phase, which is expanding at 30 miles per second, and you got the fast wind, uh, which comes in later uh, at 870 uh, miles per second. That fast wind slams into the slow wind, creates a snowplow effect, and causes it to glow. And that is why we're able to see this object because you've got different different wind levels slamming into other wind levels and ionizing it, stripping the hydrogen. Uh, and the oxygen atoms uh, from from the um, uh, from the uh, the nucleus from the core. So these are these are three very bright, easily seen planetaries uh, that we have um, on our uh, on our uh, program. Two thousand four lobular clusters. We had Will Tyrion uh, that year of um, uh, star chart fame. Uh, Will's wife was was uh, they're from Holland. Every time she'd go up and look through my telescope, she'd come down and go, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, because she, she, uh, she had never seen a lot of these things and she was enjoying herself. I want to say a few things about my friend, Barbara Wilson, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, uh, unexpectedly. Barbara was a queen of globular clusters. She had seen just about all of the globular clusters in the Northern Hemisphere, with the possible exception of UKS-1, I suppose. I'm not sure we ever saw that one. Um, but uh, if you dial up a uh, globular cluster on the internet, chances are you will see an observation by B. Wilson. That's Barbara. Um, she loved these things and she was very, very good at observing them. Um, I, she, for many years, she was my favorite observing partner. Barbara had a love of the sky, which was infectious. She got everybody around her caught up in it. Um, she co-authored a discovery paper of IC1257, which was a globular cluster. So she had something to do with discovering that. She and I came up with something called the Ain't No List, which stands for the Association of Individual, Individual Nebula and Things Nobody Observes list. Uh, we did this in 1988 as a lark and the thing caught on. Uh, some of the objects on there was to observe Alan Shepard's golf ball on the moon. Uh, observe a neutrino, uh, observe a sun glint off of Voyager 1. Um, but we also had some things that we got snookered on. Uh, we, we put some things we thought were doable, but yet impossible, uh, such as a, a, a galaxy within one degree of the Horsehead Nebula. And we gave, a, um, uh, we gave an award for that. Uh, a naked eye, uh, a naked eye uh, visible uh, sighting of an elliptical galaxy. We gave an award for that. And Barbara got snookered on another one. What we, one, of our, uh, one of our objects was the arrow that points to the celestial North Pole. And Amelia Goldberg nailed her on that one. Uh, we put an arrow on Amelia's telescope and pointed it at, at, at uh, the North Pole. And sure enough, uh, we awarded her a... Uh, a certificate. Now, these certificates were black poster paper with black writing on it, and people killed themselves to get these things. Um, but anyway, um, Barbara is no longer with us. I don't think TSP will ever be quite the same uh, without Barbara. Um, and Barb, if, you miss, if you're looking in, we miss you. Uh, we really do. Um, she, was, she, was, she, was, she was fun, fun to observe with. Hey, Larry. Uh, I, I was just going to say, uh, you suggested I name an asteroid for Barbara, and yes. that has come through. It's 63307, 63307. It reaches magnitude 18.2 in December this year, so there's an observing challenge for you. Observe wow. asteroid Barbara Wilson visually. Thank you. I'll put it on the list. It's, it's The name is still propagating, but uh, Larry uh, helped me write the citation, and we put it in, and they took their sweet time about approving that citation. It sat there in the queue for a long time, but yeah. it has come through. Good, good, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, I'm gonna move on. I'm, I'm getting seriously behind now. 
Um, Palomar 8 uh, was on the list. Palomar 8 is uh, one of the brightest Palomar uh, globular clusters. Um, its uh, distance is it's only 18,000 mile uh, light years from the uh, core of the galaxy. Um, and it's resolvable in uh, most telescopes. It's part of the galactic stream of, um, of globular clusters, which we're thinking are captured objects from uh, maybe other, uh, other, other galaxies. Um, Terzan, uh, actually Tizan uh, 3 is how you pronounce that. Um, Tizan 3 is another globular that's in the near the core of the Milky Way uh, galaxy. And I want to stop here and explain something, which is metallicity. Uh, it's typically referred to as iron over uh, hydrogen uh, ratio. And it's any element heavier than helium. Um, some people Some people put lithium in there, but essentially when the Big Bang occurred 13.8 billion years ago. It created hydrogen and helium and a smattering of lithium and nothing else. So anything heavier than an atomic number of three had to be formed in the heart of a star. And we can use the metallicity content to determine the age of that particular object because it takes so many millions or billions of, of, of years for certain metals to form. So that is a very, very good age candle and it's what astronomers use. So Tizon 3 is a very metal rich globular cluster. Most globular clusters are metal poor because they're old. Globular clusters are the debris of the galaxy uh, as planets were debris of our sun. Our sun formed out of a gas cloud and what didn't form into the sun formed planets. Uh, Milky Way galaxy, our spiral Milky Way galaxy, when it formed, the, the debris that did not form into the Milky Way galaxy formed globular clusters. So Tizon 3 um, is a little bit different because those globulars that formed with the Milky Way are all on the order of 11, 12, 13 billion years old. They're very old because our Milky Way is very old. So when we see a globular like Tizon 3 uh, that is metal rich, uh, which is minus 0.73, it's very close to the sun, we automatically think it came from somewhere else. It's not part of our Milky Way galaxy. And in this particular case, it's part of a galactic stream of other globular clusters. And they have found so far five of these events, five of these streams. So they think in the past, five galaxies have merged with our Milky Way and possibly three smaller galaxies have merged with our Milky Way. Uh, and they can determine that by these galactic uh, streams uh, of, of uh, globular, of rich metallicity globular clusters like Tizon 3. The, the youngest globular cluster is Tizon 9 and it's uh, Tizon 7, and it's only 9 billion uh, years old. So that is very much, much younger. And this obviously came from somewhere else, not from our Milky Way. Uh, Ego or Ago Tizon dismissed all these uh, Tizon uh, globulars as being totally impossible to see visually. Me, Barbara, and probably quite a few other people have seen all of them. Um, so uh, don't let the experts tell you you can't see something until you try. And that's that's the whole premise behind this uh, behind this advanced observing uh, observing list. <clears throat> All right, uh, 2005, we had Halton uh, Chip Arp um, at TSP. This, this was his second visit. Uh, his first visit was in 1995. This is one of my favorite photographs. Um, uh, Chip uh, is probably, the, not, not probably, he's definitely the, the most famous person that we've had at the Texas Star Party. Uh, he came over from Germany, where, which is where he is living. And he was uh, very, very easy to get along with. Very, very super nice guy. Everybody just, just, just loved uh, talking with Chip. And and he was full of history. His first boss was 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 Hubble. Um, so he he knew a lot of people that we, we can only read about. And he knew them personally. Uh, he took the finest photographs of interacting galaxies that had ever been taken. Uh, his Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies. Uh, which totaled 338 objects. Uh, he published that in 1966, and, and, and it's a classic. Uh, and he published those by taking photographs through the Palomar 200-inch Hale telescope, of which he was lead astronomer for 29 years. Uh, from there, he went to Germany at Max Planck Institute, and, and that's where he lived out the rest of his life. He's notorious for his redshift controversy, 
Um, the redshift by standard astronomers uh, use the redshift as a measure of distance. The further out an object is, the more it, it's, it's the, um, uh, the wavelengths of light are shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. Halkin Arp said that's not true, uh, that it has to do with how old the object is. He said these galaxies are throwing out, these galaxies are throwing out quasars, and this was one of the objects that he used. NGC 4319, Markarian 205, and there's a light bridge. Um, if Markarian 205 is 978 million light years out, and this galaxy is 70 million light years, how can there be a light bridge? He said that hey, it had to be thrown out of this galaxy. And not only that, but it's new material that's formed. And, and conventional science says all material and the universe was created at once in the Big Bang and no new material is being formed. ARP says, nope, that's new material. Well, most people don't believe him. And um, he, uh, he told me at one point that, that he didn't expect to be vindicated uh, in his lifetime, but he expected some of his, some of his theories to be proven. Um, Timothy Ferris took me off to one side and said he thought that some of us were feeling bad because Chip's ideas were, were being ridiculed by conventional science. And he says we shouldn't feel that way because his bitterest critics loved him. And as you got to know Chip, um, you can see why. I mean, a very, very nice man. He and I stayed in touch with each other until about a year before he passed away in 2013. Uh, I, I would send him an inquiry about something and a couple of days later I'd get an answer back from him. Um, so he was uh, very, very influential in a, in a lot of people, um, and he uh, was very controversial, and he relished his controversy. This is ARP 94. ARP 94, um, and um, these are two uh, uh, closely interacting galaxies of interest is NGC 3226. This is a, a term some amateurs are not familiar with. This is a Green Valley galaxy. Green Valley galaxies are spectrally uh, between the red end of the spectrum and the ultraviolet end of the spectrum, meaning the star formation is either quenched or it's about to happen, but there's really nothing much going on in that galaxy. And so it's between the red and the blue, and they call these Green Valley galaxies. This is also a liner galaxy, which is semi-active in the center. You can see it, it is brighter in the middle. Uh, a liner is sometimes called um, C for type 3 galaxies. Uh, it stands for low ionization nuclear emission line regions is what, it's, what liner stands for. Uh, but it's the weakest of the C for type uh, interacting galaxies. 2006, uh, nebulae. Uh, this one picture here has most of the type of nebulae uh, in existence. Uh, the flame nebula is an emission nebula. This is a reflection nebula. This is a dark nebula. Uh, and the only thing missing is a planetary nebula. But stars don't form in isolation. They form in nebulous clouds and in, 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 in uh, dense particles called Bach globules. Um, <clears throat> this is a Bach globule. This is one that I named the dragon. Um, it's in M8, the Lagoon Nebula. It's a very dense uh, region of gas and dust that is withstanding the radiation bombardment from NGC 6350. And a star is forming in the center of that. Um, and it is so dense that it can withstand this radiation. So this star might make it. Uh, sometimes it gets blown away and a star, a star just dies before it ever gets formed. Um, but this is called a Bach globule. They come by different names. Uh, some of them are called pre-main sequence stars. Uh, in the center is a pre-main sequence stars. Uh, some people call them young stellar objects. Some people call them evaporating gaseous globules. Or if it's in M42, the Orion Nebula, they're called proplids. But they're all the same thing, star forming dense regions. They're very cold inside. It has to be cold because if it was heat evaporating, then the star could not condense. Um, visually, you're looking for something that is a little difficult to people, but if you know how to find these things, they're not, they're not, they're not bad. This is an 11th magnitude star here. You want to use high power, you want to use a nebula filter, and when you look in your eyepiece field, you're going to see a black background. 
uh, but that black background has a blacker object in front of it. So you're looking for blacker on black, basically. Um, and when you see that, this is what, that, that's it. You, you will have seen the dragon. Uh, this is another example of another bot globule in, in Cassiopeia. Um, so uh, a lot of people uh, at the 2006 star party were able to see this, that found this. But I would encourage uh, you folks, don't just look at M8, the Lagoon Nebula. Look for some of this other stuff. The Hourglass Nebula, uh, Bernard 89, uh, NGC 6350, Bright Open Cluster, Bernard 88. All of these are features that you can see in the Lagoon Nebula. So don't just look at the Lagoon and go on to the next thing. Look at some of the features that are there. Um, this is another one of those objects that you should not pass up, NGC 4449 because it has H2 regions all over the place. It's only 12.5 million light years away. Um, and it it, it, it's, it, it's forming stars at a prodigious rate, which cannot, cannot last. Um, these, this, this image here is very close to what you see in a telescope. You'll see the nucleus, you'll see the superstar cluster, uh, you'll see this massive uh, H2 region, uh, you, this is a little more difficult, but if you look all around the periphery, now this is a star, but if you look all around the periphery, you'll see little stellarings, little star-like star things popping in and out of view. Those are H2 regions. So when you look at NGC 4449, you're actually looking at detail within another galaxy. Um, that's exciting. <clears throat> that's exciting to me, and I think that's exciting to most people. There is two tidal tails coming out of it. Uh, this is a good this is a good image of one. Uh, my friend uh, Jimmy Lowry, uh, Steve Gottlieb, and Howard Banish have seen this in uh, in Jimmy's 48-inch telescope. Uh, so this this is this is visible. 2007 ABCs of galaxies. We had Andrew Murrell uh, from Australia, who's an excellent visual observer uh, in Australia. Uh, he's still doing uh, astronomy now. He's also a professional uh, photographer. And what I tried to do was come up with uh, every letter in the alphabet with a name or type of, uh, of, of galaxy or galaxy object. And I didn't get every letter, but I got most of them. Uh, this is the letter N, uh, NGC 3190. Uh, this is an easy uh, cluster to see. Uh, in a low power uh, eyepiece field, you can see 3190, you can see the dark lane, which kind of bisects, cuts off real sharply. Um, these two are interacting. This one is in the, uh, in the background. They don't know about this one because it's not warped, but these are easily seen. They're in the neck of Leo the lion. Hoag's object uh, was the letter H. Coddington's nebula was the letter C. Um, we call this a nebula because it was discovered in 1898. In 1898, they didn't, the concept of galaxies was unheard of. So everything that was nebulous, that was extended, that was faint and fuzzy, they called a nebula. Uh, for some of the galaxies, they called them white nebula. But nevertheless, this is called Coddington's Nebula because of when it was discovered. <laughs> the local group was in 2008. And uh, the local group, uh, they don't know how many objects are in the local group, but at least 80 main galaxies, they think, in two different groups centered around the Milky Way and Andromeda. In 2007, they found some uh, really faint galaxies that were too faint to be dwarf galaxies, but too bright, uh, too condensed to be globular clusters, and they called them Hobbit galaxies, uh, which are, are dark matter dominated, basically. The object that we have for the observing list is Sextons A. Uh, it is a dwarf irregular galaxy. It's probably the best example of a dwarf irregular galaxy. And unlike most dwarf irregulars, this one has a lot of star formation. Uh, it, unfortunately, it also has a seventh magnitude star right in the middle of it. Um, but it has a low metallicity, which, what, which most uh, dwarf galaxies have. Um, but it has a dense star forming region here. There's one here uh, and there's one here. Um, this one here, uh, these stars are only 20 million years old. These stars started forming about 200 million years ago and these started uh, about 400 million years ago. Um, even though that star is in the middle of it, it's, it, it's fairly obvious and fairly easily seen. All right. Um, and, um, 
um, uh, for open uh, for uh, galaxy clusters, uh, 2009, uh, we had the Coma cluster uh, and the uh, Hercules cluster, both of which are on this year's list. The Coma cluster is uh, over a thousand galaxies. And unfortunately, you have an eighth magnitude uh, star here. If you get that eighth magnitude star out of the field, everything you see in the field will be a galaxy, which is quite exciting. Uh, this is an older, uh, well-formed galaxy cluster. So most of the galaxies are elliptical galaxies. They used to be spirals, but they merged, they formed ellipticals. And when we see something like this, we can tell that this is a well-formed uh, well uh, galaxy cluster. Of interest, the Hubble Space Telescope found over 22,000 loose globular clusters that are not part of any galaxy. They're just free-floating globular clusters that are inside uh, the Coma Galaxy Cluster. So I would uh, please take a look at this. Uh, you won't be sorry. Um, my favorite galaxy cluster is Abel 2151, however, the Hercules Cluster. Um, this is about 500 million light years away. Um, but these galaxies are predominantly, over half of them are spiral galaxies, which is very unusual. Even more unusual, those spiral galaxies have a high surface brightness, so they're easily seen. And this is a chain of them uh, that, that go up this way. And you can see them with a modest sized telescope, probably 10 or 12 inch telescope, which show you, would show you some, of these, some of these spiral galaxies half a, million, uh, half a billion light years away. Um, and again, uh, the fact that they're spiral galaxies tells us that it's not, it's undeveloped. It hasn't congealed uh, into a condensed uh, structure yet. Um, we in Houston tend to, uh, if we want to check the night sky, we look at this, this what we call the hook and the heart. Uh, this is NGC 6045. Uh, and 6045 A. Uh, these two galaxies appear to be related, but there's a difference of 29 million light years between them. The heart galaxies, this, this is uh, NGC 6050 and IC something, I forget, but um, they're, uh, they're separated by 65 million light years. So if you can see these well, you've got a good sky. You've got a very, very good sky that night. Um, in 2009, I had them look at Abel 2218. Um, this is a very distant galaxy cluster. It doesn't look distant uh, because uh, this was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. But um, I showed you earlier the double quasar. Well, here we have galaxies that are arced in the background. The orange arcs are galaxies that are 8.2 billion light years out. The blue arcs are 19.3 billion light years out. Uh, of interest is this galaxy right here, which is almost 29 billion light years out. And, and of course, these are co-moving radial distances that I'm using, actual distances, not look back time uh, distances. Um, but these arcs you won't see. Um, and the galaxy cluster is a, just a very faint object. This is the Hubble Extreme Deep Field. Uh, this is the deepest uh, image of the universe ever taken. They pointed the Hubble Space Telescope at this point in Fornax and they left it there for 23 days. It's a 23 day exposure. Uh, they got within 4.5 million years after the Big Bang. And we know the Big Bang uh, is a valid scientific theory because these very small galaxies, you can't really tell at this, uh, this scale, because even though I did center on the center of, the, of this uh, deep field, but all the small galaxies are all messed up. They haven't had time to form. You won't see any nice spiral galaxy structures in here because this is shortly after the universe came into existence and they haven't had time to form yet. Um, so in this particular case, the look back time is 13.4 uh, billion light years out of a 13.8 billion year universe. The distance of these objects, the small, the most distant objects is 32.8 billion light years. Um, so that's, that's getting out there. Mm. All right, uh, in 2010, we looked at flat and super thin galaxies. This is something that I'd never heard of before. Most amateurs, uh, many professionals had never heard of super thin galaxies. This was brought to our attention by Jim and Anna Chandler uh, in West Texas. 
And these things are a blast to look at. Um, uh, you can have it right in the center of your field and you don't see it, you don't see it, and all of a sudden, boom, there it is. It was there all along. It looks like somebody laid a hair across the center of your eyepiece field. Uh, and when you see them, it's, it's, it, it's pretty spectacular and it's something that a lot of people have not, uh, have not ever seen before. Uh, if you took one on and looked at it, uh, these of course are all edge-on galaxies. If you took one and you looked at it face-on, it would look very much like the NGC 5204. Completely no structure, not, nothing is formed or anything. Uh, one thing that they did find that was somewhat earth shattering, uh, there was a theory before they started studying these things, and there's a bunch of them out there. There's actually a flat galaxy catalog, which has almost 4,500 galaxies, which have an AB ratio, a, a length to width uh, ratio greater than seven. Um, and they studied these and they found that in the center of many of these is a supermassive black hole. Until they started studying this, the theory was that two tenths of a percent of the bulge in the center of a uh, of a spiral galaxy, that two tenths of a percent is the mass is the uh, mass of the black hole in the center. They've discarded that theory because many of these super thin galaxies that have no bulge have massive black holes that are throwing out material. Most of these most of these edge-on galaxies are like our friend here that most of us have seen, NGC 4565, with a central bulge, and they have what we call a box or peanut-shaped center. And if I blow this up, you can see it's 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 depressed in the middle, kind of hourglass. It looks like a peanut. Um, and about half of the bulge bulges in galaxies uh, have that uh, peanut-shaped uh, center. The classic standard um, uh, super thin galaxy um, is this one, um, which I can't read it. It's, it's, let, me, let me back up. <laughs> um, it is UGC 7321. And it's a, it's, it's, it's a classic example. It's an underdeveloped galaxy. It has a scale height of only 450 light years. The thickness of our Milky Way galaxy is 12 to 1300 light years. So it's very thin. There's no central bulge. Uh, it's very isolated. And all of these super thin galaxies have little or no stellar development for whatever reason. They're not real sure why that is, uh, but they have very little development. They're old galaxies, but nothing much has happened in them. And all of them are dark matter dominating. And in this particular case, the mass to light ratio is 12. Um, uh, the question came up, do we live in a super thin galaxy? Well, it looks like we do. I mean, that looks very thin, uh, but here in the center of our Milky Way is our galaxy bulge. So the answer to that is no, we do not live in a super thin galaxy. All right, 2011 uh, proximities, friends of friends. I tried to pick objects that are close to galaxies that we typically look at, but we look at the galaxy and we ignore what's around it like M81, um, very few people look at Holmberg 9, which is parked right next to it. It's easily found. Uh, if you take these two stars as a finder and you take a right angle uh, using these as a distance uh, factor, and you go back the same way towards the galaxy, boom, there's Hol Hol Holmberg 9, uh, parked right next to M81 and hardly anybody ever looks at it. Uh, I see 4278 right next to M51, hardly anybody ever looks at it. They don't know it's there. Um, M13, IC 4617, uh, this is a Seifert type two barred galaxy um, that is easily found. Uh, it's only 12 arc minutes north of uh, Messier 13. Uh, if you don't see the galaxy, at least you get to look at, uh, at the finest, one of the finest uh, globular clusters in the night sky. Um, but this galaxy is a Seifert type two uh, barred uh, galaxy. And it's 55 million light years away. Uh, contrast that with M13, which is 22,000 light years away. Um, to find it, look for these, this, this, this bent uh, rectangular, uh, bent parallelogram type uh, of stars. Uh, these are 13th magnitude stars, so they're easily found. Uh, once, you find once you find these, then there's your, there's your target. 
All right, 2012, anything ABEL? Um, on the list, we had ABEL 37, uh, which is a uh, rare uh, planetary nebula that's in the constellation of Virgo. Uh, there's only four uh, planetaries in Virgo. Uh, this one is very bright. Uh, a nebula filter is required. With this one, you don't see anything until you put a filter on it, and then bam, there it is, very obvious. In 2012, we did something that I was very pleased with, and, and those of us that saw it was very pleased. I've been talking about gravitational arcs um, and things that, 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 that get magnified by foreground galaxies. Well, ABEL 2152 has the closest gravitational arc, which is right here, of any of the arcs, and we were able to see it. Um, to my knowledge, no one had ever seen a gravitational arc before. And we, uh, uh, we were able to, uh, to see the arc, which is almost 2 billion light years away. Uh, it's being magnified by this foreground galaxy, which is 612 million light years away. And we could, we could, we could see it, uh, we can see it in a 36 inch telescope without too much difficulty. And this is what it looks like up close. And you can see it is, it is an arc. Um, some other people saw it on the field, and, and uh, that's one of those rare things that, that, that you get to see that most people have never seen before. All right, illusions, 2013. Anything that um, um, doesn't appear quite right. When we look in the night sky, everything is an illusion. The brighter stars are not necessarily the closer stars. They just may be more massive stars. Our closest star, Proxima Centauri, uh, only four light years away is actually invisible to the naked eye. It's the 11th magnitude star. So everything up there is an illusion. And this is a classic illusion here because you've got uh, two galaxies, NGC 6314A, which is a face on spiral superimposed over 3314B in the background. Uh, and they're separated by a distance of 85 billion uh, light years. Um, and the advantage of super uh, imposition like this is you can see dust, you can see material all the way down to the core of the galaxy. So that's the value of these things. That year, I wanted to put something in on our Saturday night uh, speakers. Um, we had uh, uh, Zoltan Levy, uh, who, is, who gets to play with the Hubble Space Telescope images uh, talking to us that year. Uh, he has a wonderful job that uh, most of us would give a right arm for. Uh, but the Saturday night giveaways, the Friday and Saturday night giveaways were by these two, um, uh, Bob Summerfield uh, and Mike Planchon. And they were hilarious. They could make big money if they went to Las Vegas because they kept people in stitches. I mean, there was really a lot of fun. It was a, just a comedy show. Uh, and we don't do that anymore. Um, but while it was going, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and here's Amelia between the two of them wondering like, what's going on? Uh, <laughs> Um, are these interacting or are these not interacting? You can't just look at them and tell. Uh, you can't tell the illusion. These galaxies here, um, NGC 5679b, this appears to be in the foreground. Um, but the redshift theory says it's 397 million light years, even though its spiral arm appears to be in front of this foreground galaxy. Illusion or is the redshift wrong? We don't know. Um, here's a, a, a couple of galaxies here, UGC 5904, 301 light years. Uh, it's a background galaxy according to the redshift theory. Um, uh, it's a foreground galaxy according to the redshift theory. But this galaxy, this MCG galaxy, which obviously appears superimposed on it, is 30 million light years further away. So that doesn't doesn't make sense. And the same thing here. These two galaxies, this one, the spiral arms are in front of this foreground galaxy. So all of these are illusions or the redshift theory is wrong in this particular case, but this is what we did uh, this particular year. 2014, uh, I tried to use anything uh, that visual or photographed red. Uh, Sharpless galaxies, uh, this is Cygnus, uh, this is our Milky Way, and all of these are H2 regions all along, uh, all along the Cygnus Milky Way. Uh, T. Lyra is a very bright uh, carbon star uh, in the constellation of, of Lyra. It's, it goes by the name of the jewel in the heart. Its distance is 2,000 light years. 
Uh, and some of these stars, when they when they puff up, they go to the red giant phase or the uh, asymptotic giant phase. They get so cool on the outside that, that the carbon goes back to molecular form, soot. Uh, and the light shining through that soot is red. Uh, and it causes the stars to appear uh, like, uh, like T. Lyra here. And there's a bunch of them. And when the star gets swells up real big, it gets orange or yellow. And when it shrinks back down, because all of these are stars are pulsating, when it shrinks back down, it become, some of them become blood red. I mean, literally look like a drop of blood on the sky. NGC 6781 is a classic, beautiful planetary nebula. Uh, here again, this is a pole on view. We're looking at the Taurus. We're looking down the polar region through the, through the planetary and it's slightly tilted, uh, 23 degrees from pole on. So the Northern side here appears washed out. The reason it's washed out is we're seeing the Taurus, or we're seeing the, uh, the lobe on the other side uh, due to the downward tilt. We're seeing a little bit of the lobe on the other side and it's causing this side to be washed out. And you can see that uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the telescope view. This is a beautiful, beautiful planetary. Um, it's an Aquila and everyone doing the list should, should, uh, should take a look at this one. All right, um, I'm really running out of time, but um, my favorite part of the presentation is this part here. Um, in 2015, I decided to look at Markarian galaxies and I had no idea what I was getting myself into um, because uh, Benjamin uh, Markarian worked out of the Bayurikan Observatory in Armenia. This is, some, this, is, this is an issue that most amateurs know little or nothing about. Armenia is a landlocked country east of Turkey, and they do a tremendous amount of science over there. It's just frigging unbelievable, uh, the work that's coming out of that observatory. Uh, but this is the cover page for that year's talk. Uh, this is the Markarian chain. A lot of amateurs know it's called Markarian chain, but they don't necessarily know why. Uh, Markarian uh, in 1961 decided to take a look at this and he wondered, well, maybe these galaxies are affiliated with each other. Maybe they're gravitationally attached. Uh, these, are, these two bright galaxies here, M84 and M86, but the rest of them they didn't know about. <laughs> well, he not only found out they were gravitationally attached, they were bound together, but he discovered the center of the Virgo galaxy cluster. Uh, in doing so, um, and made himself famous. But he's not known for that in astronomical terms. Um, his boss, uh, a man by the name of Victor Ambart Sumian, who um, people in Armenia uh, and uh, people in Russia uh, look at Ambart Sumian almost with godlike reverence. Uh, unfortunately, he did his work uh, during the Cold War, had we not had a Cold War with, with, with Russia, Ambert Sumian, I believe, would be right up there with Albert Einstein. The man was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, he had a theory back in the 30s that things in the universe were expanding. Uh, when he was in his 20s, he discovered the planetary nebula were expanding. When everybody else said, no, things were gravitationally collapsing. Um, Ambert Sumian got uh, Markarian to start hunting up objects with what they call ultraviolet excess that are active in the center, in the core. Uh, and Markarian went out and discovered 3,500 of them, 3,563 of them. And that is what Markarian is known for. He did this in two different surveys. Uh, and since then, over 2,500 professional papers have been written on Markarian galaxies. Uh, they're active, they're throwing out material, um, and it's, it's just incredible the work level that Markarian did with these. Uh, he started out, uh, all, all of these are Markarian galaxies are active. They have active cores, active nuclei. Um, and way back in 1908, Vesto Slifer knew there was something different about some galaxies. Back in 1943, Carl Seifert, uh, who worked out of McDonald Observatory in West Texas, um, cataloged a bunch of galaxies that had some kind of activity in the center, 
um, but they didn't really know what that activity was. But when you put a spectrum on them, the uh, certain lines were shifted, um, which indicated a high level of excitation. And, and here, um, uh, here is a couple of them. And when you see um, that type of activity in the core, um, we, we know something is going on. Uh, Seifert didn't know exactly what or why, um, but Markarian survey defined what happened uh, in the cores of these galaxies. Uh, and they rated these Seifert galaxies. A Seifert galaxy one is the most active, 1.5 is less active, 1.9 is even less, a two is even less. Seifert type three are the liners, the low ionization nuclear emission line region galaxies that I was talking about. Um, so Markarian's survey somewhat defined what is going on um, with, these, with these spectral lines. But, uh, and this is some of, the, some of the galaxies that I've got um, uh, on this year's list, which I won't go into for time, uh, but you guys should look at this one, 3690 and I see 694. You should see this, this ionization region in between them. Um, at first glance, you might see this as one object, but it's really two if you take the time and patience to study it. Uh, and you can see this H2 region uh, in the center here. These Markarian objects uh, out of the 3,500, 1,863 are galaxies, 1,700 are stars. Many of these are quasars. Uh, and um, 761 are AGNs. A when we see AGNs, it's a loose definition, but typically these are, um, uh, they have a um, very active core, um, a, um, uh, a very, very, very dense core. Um, uh, and um, um, the, the other galaxies are, are due to um, uh, star formation, uh, active H2 regions and stuff like that. Uh, age, and when you see AGN, you typically, uh, it, it's uh, in, in, in coincidence with black holes, basically supermassive black holes. Markarian 421 is one of the more active ones. Uh, it, uh, this blazer uh, from this object is pointed directly at Earth. So we're seeing a tremendous amount of energy uh, uh, its magnitude is average is about 12.8, um, yet um, it is uh, uh, extremely distant, uh, it's 520 million light years away. <clears throat> here is, Mark, here is uh, Victor Ambartsumian, and I could go on and on about this guy. Um, uh, he was a founder of theoretical astrophysics in the Soviet Union. He founded uh, the Yurikon Observatory. Uh, he was lecturing at Yerevan uh, Observatory when he was 16. Um, he discovered uh, planetaries were expanding in his 20s. Um, uh, the, the, the man was incredible. Um, he instructed Markarian to find the Markarian galaxies. He instructed uh, Romela Shakhbazian uh, to find galaxy clusters. Uh, and in 1958, uh, he made an announcement that stunned the astronomical world. Um, I like to thank uh, Dr. Eric Michaelian. Uh, I initially contacted Dr. Petrosian, who put me in touch with Dr. Michaelian. Uh, and Eric Michaelian has been very helpful. Uh, he is, uh, I think, uh, Ambert Sumian's uh, protege. Uh, he seems to run things over there. Uh, he has his hands in everything. He's, he's published uh, 300 uh, uh, articles. I get emails from him from Rome, from Los Angeles, from New York, from all over the world. He's in high demand and he's been very helpful with me. He's also in charge of the Ambert Sumian uh, Gold Medal Prize, which is awarded every two years, uh, which is a half million dollars uh, for someone contributing to astronomy. Ambert Sumian um, based his, uh, his theory of uh, active nuclei on this, Ambert Sumian's not. He found that this was being expelled from this galaxy, which is being tore up by this elliptical galaxy and is throwing this material out. Uh, this plume of material is 325,000 light years. And if you remember our nearest star is four light years. So this is tremendous energy. And Ambert Sumian uh, noted that this was ejected. This was a new, galaxy that formed out of this material. Um, he was initially not believed. The powers that be at the time was, was uh, Fritz Zwicky, Jan Ort, and Chandra Sikar. None of them believed him. 
they thought that galaxies are so much power that nothing can escape. Uh, you have millions and billions of stars or gravity fields that are holding everything in, so how can something uh, be ejected? Um, after, in 1963, when they found 3C273 and they found out something was ejected from it, they all went back and uh, congratulated him on uh, this discovery, and some of them apologized to him for not believing it. And basically what he found was that around the black hole is an accretion disk, which is moving very rapidly. This is the source of the broad emission lines. Further out from the jet uh, is low velocity clouds. This is the narrow emission lines. So your Seifert 1 galaxies, if you can see this, if you can see into the center, you got a Seifert 1. If you're at the side where you can't see that, you get a Seifert 2. If you're at the very side, you see a Seifert 3. If that jet is pointing straight at you, you get a blazer or a BL Lacerda type object. All of this um, came from this man, Victor Ambarzumi. Um, uh, and that changed the way we look at galaxies um, forevermore. Um, it's, it's a shame to just gloss over this page because there's a tr tremendous amount of science here. Uh, but Marat Arakelian went out and uh, found out that is there a, a, an affiliation between high surface brightness galaxies and active galactic nuclei? And he found out the answer was yes. Uh, he discovered 621 of these objects. Um, Misha Makarian found 600, uh, 706 more uh, that they added to the database that was unknown. Ramallah Shakbazian went out and discovered 377 compact galaxy groups, which was much further than the Hickson groups. These are on the order of billions of light years away. Um, and then Elma Parsamian uh, was, uh, she did a catalog of cometary uh, nebula uh, and she's still at it. And uh, as a matter of fact, last night I read an article that uh, she had been interviewed with and, and she said that thanks to Victor Ambart Sumian, that's why she got into astronomy and why she was still into it. So this is a tremendous amount of work that I'm showing in one, uh, one slide, unfortunately. Um, these are some of, the, uh, some of the many, many things that have come out of this one small observatory, the biggest telescope, a 102 inch telescope, by the way. Um, but as a final thought, and this is me saying this, um, I, the the Bayurakan Observatory may be the most prolific observatory for discoveries related to astronomy and theoretical astrophysics of any observatory anywhere in the world. I believe that is true. I ran that across Dr. Michaelian, and his response was, "Larry, I'm, I'm, um, I'm I, I, I can't really agree to that. I'm, I, I'm too modest to say that is true. Uh, so let me just agree not to disagree with you." Um, um, this place is amazing. Uh, the amount of science coming out of here is incredible. They do a science camp for kids every summer and they have hundreds and hundreds of kids come over uh, to learn about the night sky. Um, and this is a place most people know nothing about. Uh, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to promote by Uricon Observatory uh, in Armenia because I really, really believe these people are on the right track. <laughs> All right, uh, 2017, uh, open clusters and asterisms. We had Don Pettit as an asteroid, uh, astronaut uh, describing a living on a space station. We had Pranvera Hassini or Pran that we know her as. Uh, she's the little girlfriend of most of us guys. Uh, she's, she's a very, very sweet uh, young lady, very impressive young lady. Um, she's from Kosovo uh, in Sarajevo. And she decided as a teenager, she was gonna throw a star party for Kosovo. Uh, she got together some telescopes, uh, none larger than eight inch. Um, and the day, of the, uh, the, the day of the star party, 10,000 people showed up. Uh, it was amazing. Um, since then, she's been traveling the world. Uh, she just got back from Australia. Uh, she's promoting uh, astronomy um, and she's getting to do a lot of really neat things. And she's uh, getting ready to go to the uh, University of Arizona, I believe. Uh, but an incredible young lady, and it'll be uh, it'll be very interesting to see where she ends up, what she ends up doing. 
Um, this is Messier 16, the pillars of creation, which you can see. I had this on the uh, 2017 list. Um, this tower here, uh, these are all, you could call them block, block globules. Uh, stars are forming in here, but this tower is four light years tall, the distance between us and our nearest star. If you look at this, uh, well, these, these clouds are, are blocking what's behind there. It's blocking the stars. If you look at this in infrared light, like this, uh, you can see all of the stars that you cannot see that were blocked, um, that were blocked uh, in, in visual light. But the other thing about this, this is like the uh, dragon that I showed you a minute ago. You can see this if you're looking, if you know you get this in the field and what you're looking for um, uh, is a black background but a blacker background in front of it. Uh, and you'll see that L-shaped black feature in front of a black background, use a filter, um, and you should be able to see that with too much, uh, without too much difficulty. But like a lot of these dark nebula, patience and time, you need to spend the necessary time to be able to see this. Um, but um, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, people call it the pillars of creation. Uh, Robert Burnham called it a star queen. It's the same thing, uh, but it's in uh, M16, uh, what we call the Eagle Nebula. So um, uh, the open clusters that I've got on this year's list, uh, NGC 6645, which has a very definite ring feature in the center, which is probably blown out by a supernova explosion. Uh, Berkeley 82, IC 4996. These are all easy open clusters. Nobody should have any difficulty uh, observing any of these objects. Asterisms are stars, uh, groupings of stars that appear to be gravitationally bound, but they're not. They're at different distances. They have nothing to do with one another. And the most common uh, asterism that we see in the night sky is the Big Dipper, because most of those stars have nothing to do with each other. Um, so it's an asterism. And the object that I've got on this year's list is an object called the, toad, the toadstool, which was discovered by this lady here, Sue French, uh, who for years has been a Sky and Telescope contributing e editor. Uh, she goes to Stellafane every year, uh, and she and I usually have our telescopes set up right next to each other, and she's a lot of fun to observe with. Uh, a for asterism is an is a asterism that was discovered by Houston's Bram Wiseman, uh, at the Texas Star Party some years ago, and he was looking for something else. And he just stumbled across this and he says, wow, that looks like the letter A. And now uh, it's my understanding that is an official asterism that Bram found. Uh, this is something you can find as well. There's, there's asterisms all over the sky. Uh, all, 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 the only thing that's limiting people is their imagination because that, this stuff is everywhere. Um, the last uh, group I'm uh, talk about is uh, Edward Emerson Bernard. He's another hero of mine. Um, uh, we did this back in 2018. This is him with the 36-inch uh, telescope at Lick Observatory in California. Um, he was a he started out working when he was eight years old as a photographer's assistant. So he knew a lot about photography, and he took some of the best photographs anyone had ever taken. He also had some of the best eyesight anybody had ever taken. That year, we had Richard Berry uh, as a guest speaker. Um, and Richard's been there several times. I think this was his third or fourth time to uh, TSP. But Barnard was interested in mainly two things. What are these dark nebula and what are comets? Because both of them were complete mystery to people around 1880s uh, to 1910, 1920s. Um, and Barnard went a long way towards explaining what both of these were. Um, as far as comets go, uh, comets would get a mysterious thing. Sometimes their tail would just completely fall off, uh, and they didn't understand why. Well, Barnard eventually figured out this tail disconnect had to do with the sun, uh, with the um, uh, sun sending out uh, radiation and he noticed that disconnect features happen more when there was a lot of sunspots, uh, when the sun was active. 
Uh, and as it turned out, he was exactly correct. That is what caused these tail disconnect figures. Uh, Barnard also took the first photograph of the Milky Way. Um, astronomers before that had known that the Milky Way was formed of millions of stars, but they had no idea how many. He took this photograph in 1889 and it caused a sensation. Stars everywhere. No one had ever seen this before. Um, so that was, that was quite phenomenal. Um, uh, Barnard also discovered Amalthea, the, the, the fifth moon of uh, Jupiter, uh, which made him famous. He discovered Barnard's star, which is the most rapidly moving star, uh, the second closest star uh, to us. Uh, he had incredible, incredible eyesight, and he observed every single night um, that, uh, that he could when the moon was not up. This year's uh, observing objects are Bernard 90, uh, which requires high magnification to see it. Uh, it's in a rich stellar background in Sagittarius, so it somewhat stands out. I have these clouds here because Barnard, um, before he figured out what they were, they thought these were holes in the universe. Um, that's what Herschel said they were. Uh, Barnard uh, revered Herschel. Uh, and so it was thought that these were holes in the universe, but it just didn't quite seem right. And when Barnard saw a, star, a sky like this, where he saw the uh, clouds that were backlighted by the moon, he realized these were clouds that were in the foreground of these stars that were not illuminated, not irradiated by anything else and were blacking out the light in, in, in the background. And in that, he was, very, he was absolutely correct. And the last item I've got is NGC 6818, um, which is a very bright planetary nebula. You can see color in it, green, blue, blue, green, depending on your particular eyesight. Uh, it's located only 40 arc minutes northwest of Barnard's galaxy, NGC 6822, which Barnard also discovered. Uh, and it's a very bright, easily seen uh, planetary nebula. <clears throat> Next year, we're going to take a look at John Lewis uh, Emil Dreyer's index catalog. Uh, most people are familiar with the NGC New General Catalog. Most people are not so familiar with the index catalog, which is an addition to the NGC. So next year, we're going to be looking at uh, index catalog objects. So that'll be the subject, uh, subject then. So as a final thought, um, I just want to say that somebody is always doing what somebody else said couldn't be done. Don't let anybody tell you you cannot see something through a telescope in the night sky until you've actually tried. Uh, so many people think they can't see something, that it's some exotic name or it's supposedly an infrared object, so I can't see it with my visual eyesight. I've seen plenty of the infrared objects. So if, if it's up there uh, and you are into visual astronomy, um, Take a look. Don't, don't, don't let anybody or anything dissuade you from trying to see anything in the universe through a telescope. Um, so uh, here's my uh, email address. I'm sorry this took so long, but it, it's, it's hard to cover the entire universe uh, in, in an hour. Um, but um, those of you doing the advanced observing list, I want to wish you good luck. And for the rest of you that are still here, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Great talk, Larry. Really appreciate everything. And, and like you said, I know it's a lot to get through in a short amount of time, but uh, wow, that was just absolutely, absolutely fascinating to, to listen to. So we had a lot of comments in the chat room here, but I didn't see any questions. So wanted to give uh, anybody who wanted a chance to, yeah. <laughs> anybody who wanted to ask a question of Larry to come off of mute and ask it. I, I have a few of my own, but I wanted to let uh, a few others get theirs in first. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of uh, amazing amount of stuff. Great presenta presentation, Larry. Uh, a lot of accolades there. I was going to ask you, uh, you know, Larry, as, as you've been doing this now for over two decades, uh, a little over two decades, you know, there's a lot of information that goes into and a lot of uh, research and preparation that goes into uh, creating these lists. Um, how much time does it actually take you from, you know, kind of that first, you know, inception of, hey, this is what I want to do for an observing list to actually completing that? And I know it can vary from year to year, but, but on average, how, how much would you say it would take? 
Uh, um, and, that's kind of an easy question uh, or easy answer. It takes a year. <laughs> um, uh, because like with the planetary nebula, I started out, I observed over 300 planetaries to come up with about 50, um, most of which were stellar. And I didn't want people to look at stellar objects. So I spend a year observing with these objects. Uh, and I have other people observing with me, Steve and Amelia Goldberg, K2, Keith uh, Rivich, other people. Um, it, it's not just me. Um, but um, I'm also, in, in addition to doing the observing, I'm doing the research. And the research comes from professional papers. Um, I strictly use, pretty much strictly use professional uh, publications because you find information there you don't find anywhere else. You don't find in Sky and Telescope Magazine, Astronomy Magazine, or any place else. And that's where I get a lot of the information uh, that I use. And I try to make these objects interesting. I try to pick objects that are saying something, that are doing something, that are exploding, that are interacting, that are doing whatever. Um, and it really, uh, it keeps me up late at night. And I would say, really, it takes me a year. Uh, it takes me a year to do each, each, uh, uh, each of these lists that I, uh, or these subjects that I've done. Absolutely incredible. I know Stephen Jones had a question in the chat. Stephen, do you want to come off mute and ask? Yeah, sure, Larry. I just wanted to double check one thing. Um, has the current list changed at all since you first put it out there ahead of the uh, 2020 Texas Star Party that was canceled? I asked because I was one of the 15 folks who was at the Prude that year anyway, and I did the list. <laughs> Make sure I can um, sleep. Yeah, yeah you, you, well, you'd be covered. You only have to do 20 of the 40. Um, yeah. I, I think I did make a couple of minor changes, but it was it, it, not much, uh, it, yeah. not much. Um, it, 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 as far as the objects go, I, I, I did do some more research into the technical okay. side of it, but as far as the objects, no, not, not very much. All right. All right, great question, Stephen. And uh, again, if anybody has any questions for Larry, uh, feel free to come off of mute and ask your questions because I've got others that I'm going to ask as well. So get yours in before I, I get mine. So, I can't possibly have answered everything in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> I have one. Although, great, uh, although in this, the length of time I took, I probably almost did. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, Larry, uh, you know, when you've been, you've been doing these object lists for a long time. Uh, is there an object that you've run across that has like, you know, surprised you? kind of startled you as far as like its visibility versus, you know, you always say at the end of your talks, you know, something, somebody is looking at something you thought you couldn't, you know, is there some, is there one particular object that sticks out to you like that? That really, um, uh, I, I can't say one particular object, but almost all of them. Um, I see objects that have a posted magnitude in some cases at 16th magnitude and as bright as all get out in a telescope. Um, you cannot go by posted magnitudes because they're integrated magnitudes. Uh, you take something that's this big, uh, integrated magnitude is, is whatever, and you take it down to a point source. So if you have something this big and they'll say, well, it's seventh magnitude. Yeah, it's seventh magnitude is a point, but this big is something a lot fainter. Mm -hmm. um, so you really cannot go by published magnitudes and I have that happen to me all the time. Uh, I have some of these infrared objects, uh, like I, I, I can think of one some time back, the red rectangle uh, that Barbara Wilson and I looked at some years ago, supposedly supposed to be invisible. Or all of these Tizon globular clusters, they're supposed to be invisible because they're infrared objects. They're behind so much dust that theoretically we can't see them. We don't have infrared eyes, so we can't see those. But yet I've seen all the Tizon globulars. Um, I've seen the red rectangle and, and supposedly I wasn't supposed to be able to see that because I don't have infrared eyes. Uh, so I would have to say not, not, not one object comes to mind, but many, many, many. And I've had it happen to me over and over and over. And I've got to where I don't really listen to magnitudes. Uh, if, I, if, if something is of interest and I want to take a look at it, I go for it. Um, if, you're, if you really want to get down to it, uh, and you can find in some in some cases I publish surface brightness is better than magnitude because if you find something with a high surface brightness, chances are you can see it. Um, so uh, it, it's a it, 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 there's no one thing, but but many 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 things that that that, that would be the answer to that, that that question. Awesome, thank you, man. Appreciate you. 
All right. Anybody else have any questions? Great question there. Well, thanks. Okay. If nobody's going to chime in, then I'll go ahead and ask my second question. Um, and I asked you this before, Larry, and I hope you've had a chance to kind of uh, think about it. And when I asked it, I know it was a little tough. You know, you said it's kind of like asking, you know, which one of your kids is your favorite. Um, but, but when you've compiled all of these observing programs over the years, was there one that really just kind of uh, just struck you as, as your favorite overall uh, and, and why? Uh, well, I would revert back to my uh, uh, favorite child uh, answer. <laughs> um, I, 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 I devote an, a year of my time to each of these subjects because uh, so they become very dear uh, to me. Uh, but probably I would say the planetary nebula one that I did in 2003, where I'm literally looking at over 300 planetaries. Uh, I was very proud of that work, that body of work. Uh, Keith Rivich helped me immensely uh, with that particular uh, observing list. Um, uh, any of the interacting galaxies, uh, uh, the a uh, active galactic nebula objects uh, are of interest, but probably if I had to narrow it down to one thing, I could. Uh, and that is the work uh, that uh, Markarian did uh, and Victor M. Bartsumian did uh, at Bayurikon Observatory. I am totally blown away by the magnitude of the work that they have done uh, and how much science they have contributed uh, to the science of astronomy that we all love. Uh, it is, it, it's, it's incredible. That work is still going on uh, and I hope someday to go over there myself. Uh, so that probably uh, to answer your question, that 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 probably means the most to me of of, uh, of all the projects that I've done. Wonderful, Larry. Well, you know what? If I had to take a guess, I would have guessed the same thing because I've seen you know the passion that you have about those um, th those particular years and the and the topics whenever you speak about it. So um, yeah, that, that certainly comes through. Yeah, you start you you start reading about the magnitude of what they've done, and I mean every sentence is like, oh my god, oh my god. You know, I mean, it's just it's incredible. Um, yeah. And they do it with a, the, the biggest telescopes, 102 inch telescope. So let's see. Yeah, for more. yeah. All right. Last chance for anybody to come off mute and ask uh, Larry a question here. So I do have one last question for you, Larry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Not hearing anybody coming off mute. So my last question, and you kind of touched on this earlier, right? Uh, the Texas Star Party itself uh, is, is really unique in that, uh, you know, we go there to, to do all of this wonderful observing, wonderful science and things like that. Um, but there's so much more that happens there. And, you know, kind of everything that goes on there uh, combined really makes for a wonderful experience. Um, as, as you've done this uh, for over the years now, what do you think is your favorite part of the Texas Star Party itself? Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> Oh man, uh, back to my favorite kid. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry um, for these, but you know, it, it's, it's one yeah, of these things it's, where, I, you yeah. know, it, it's, there, there, there's so much. I, I, I think a lot of it was, what was how I progressed myself. Um, the first five years, whenever I went out there, it was strictly for the sky. Uh, and if we had a cloudy night, I, I kind of get an attitude, you know, I, I waited for this and it's cloudy and it's cloudy, this is terrible. Um, I've learned over the years that the people that go to the Texas Star Party is every bit as much as important as the night sky. Um, because you have five to 600 people, like-minded people that love the night sky, um, that, that have the same interest as you have. I can learn from them, they learn from me. And it's a, it's, it's a wonderful experience. And, and uh, to me, there's no better place to be under the night sky. Uh, and if you can be under the night sky with 500 people who love it as much as you do, it doesn't get much better than that, I think. Um, so that's why I, I just, I, I love the Texas Star Party and I will continue to go there. Uh, I have not missed a single year since 1987. And I don't plan on missing a single year until I just absolutely cannot go. Um, it, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful 100% uh, experience, both for the, um, uh, the, the astronomical experience and the people experience. Uh, so I would, I would greatly encourage anyone that's not been there. Uh, if you haven't been and you have a love of the night sky, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you'll love it. 
Oh, Larry, you know, I couldn't have said that better myself. And, you know, the, the more that I've gone to the Texas Star Parties, uh, the more that that rings true. You know, the, the skies are wonderful. The amenities that you have there are top notch. Um, you know, like I said, you, you don't find many places to observe better than that. But uh, mm -hmm. I've always found the camaraderie and the people out there really are, are, are the difference. So, Larry, well, thank you. And I, I, would, I, would, I would add, you know, one sure. more thing that I just thought of. Uh, the, the management and the people that run the Texas Star Party. It seemingly happens by accident. Nothing, nothing ever goes wrong. Um, that's a well-run, that's how a well-run organization should be run. And that's how the Texas Star Party is run. I know for a fact a tremendous amount of work goes on in the background to produce this, to get this to work each and every year. Um, and it, it comes off seemingly seamlessly every single year. So uh, that's, just, that's just another plus. That's a, an another reason uh, why the Texas Star Party is what it is. Amen to that, Larry. So <laughs> on that, we'll uh, wrap up. But, but again, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Uh, like you said, we could spend an hour on each one of these years and still would barely scratch the surface. So I really appreciate you taking the time to go through it with us and share all of this. And for everybody who's got the opportunity to, uh, to observe under some nice skies, give Larry's uh, advanced observing program a shot this year. So we've got a week to, to do it. And for some of us, we may have to drive out a, a little bit to get some clear skies, <laughs> but it may be worth a shot. So thank you so much, Larry. Really appreciate it. And, and really looking forward to seeing you and the 36 inch telescope back out on the field, hopefully next year. So Great. Looking we'll forward do to it. That. All right. And uh, thank you. Thank you guys for sticking with me. Those of you that did. Thank you. Thank you.